with these jet lays, they don't have an index on them. So I'll use an indexing wheel. Okay. I've got a small one for a smaller lathe, and then I have this one. And all you do is set that down here. Okay, so now I can loosen the little uh, set screw, then I can come back, okay? Has everybody seen one of these before? It's just magnets. It's made by... Uh, Alice Sam Engineering. I bought it probably 20 years ago. I'm guessing. Yes, sir. Uh huh. No, I haven't because I usually, they're going to be closer. Um, at home, I actually don't use cold jaws, I use vacuum check on everything. Uh, the way my shop is set up, I have my main lathe I turn on here. And then I have this one for my vacuum chuck for the backside of bowls. And then I have this one down here for my hollowing, the way it's set up now. And the, this lathe that I'm doing my main turning on has indexing on it. And my, it's funny, my Powermatic 40, uh, 3224, or what, let's see, no, I'm sorry. No, the small one. 3520B doesn't have indexing on it, so I use this. And my 4224 uh, Powermatic, it has an indexing wheel I had made put on it. The guy that makes all the aluminum tools, you see him at SWAT. I just, what's his name? Just a great guy. Anyway, he makes a lot of different tools. And uh, that's where I got my wheel made. And I copied, you know, the 4220B. Have you guys seen that indexing wheel that they've got on the end of that? I took something like that and had him machine it, put the numbers around the outside of it, and on the 4220B, it has got uh, that arm that comes down and screws into the indexing wheel. I bought one of those arms because I didn't want to buy the lathe. And then I actually took the button out of the end of the 4220B, took the mechanism apart, put it together backwards so that I don't have to screw it in. I just pull it out, push it back in, and the spring holds it. So the spring holds it in, I pull it out. And then when I'm not using it, I can turn it. So that is how I made my indexing on the 4224. And uh, the main lathe I turn on is a, a robust American Beauty, and it's got the wheel built onto it. Okay, But for a long time, this is how I did it. And this works great. I really like it. All right, and so then you can choose how many divisions you want in it or you can just hold it in an Ellie Avacera class I think it was years ago we made this wooden post with this little u-shape thing on it okay and we were doing the edge marking on the edge of a platter and it might have been an Alster class but it was one of those guys and I was trying to figure out how I could do this because I was using my tool rest every time holding my pencil against it, trying to get a good straight line. So I went to my carpenter pencil, because I'm a carpenter, and so I would hold it as flat as I could, and then I'd make my mark. And by the time I went around, some of them were off. Then I realized I really don't want them perfect, because it's like a fruit, and they're not perfect. But then I thought, okay, I can at least get a straight line, and I rebuilt some chairs for our church and the pieces that came off, I was throwing them in the trash and then this curved piece was there. I go, there, that'll work. So I didn't throw it in the trash. This piece. All right, so you can set this here. It really needs to go to where your center of the bowl is. And this lathe has the post and I could have cut that off. I'm sorry that I didn't do a better job of preparing. But All right, so you can take, tighten this up and decide how many divisions you want. 
Okay, and since this doesn't go to the center, that's going to really throw me off a little bit, isn't it? <laughs> you guys are all so smart. Okay, all right. It's a great idea. Actually, it's pretty close. Okay, so I can follow that around. So if you want to see what it looks like if I'm faking it on the top, that's giving me a nice flat area to hold my pencil down, and I just pull it across. Okay. Now, I've made some, and if you, if you can see the lines, can you look at the lines on these? Can you see that at all? Are the pencil lines? All right, so these are pretty close to being the same if you just glanced at it, but there's one hole off here. So this one and this one are the same. And this one's a little bit narrower, okay? And then this one's narrower, this one's wider. Now this one's too narrow, so I decided it wouldn't work. And so I came back, so I made this division. Yep, it's really off now. Okay. I can follow that across. All right, so we can, we'll be able to use it over there. That's okay. All right, now what you can do, if you look right here, and we'll look at the bottom of these. Look at the bottom of these bowls. Okay, so I decided this one's a little bit bigger, and the sections, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sections. All right, see the star that it makes, that pattern? There. Okay, so it's kind of got a star pattern. And as I was developing this thing, looking at it, I didn't intend for that to happen. Purely an accident. I thought, you know, this is, I kind of like that. How do I get it to be the same as I draw that so I see how it works? Okay, so I, I'm going to come in here. This one is farther in, these, one of these divisions. This one's farther out. This one matches. The next one I would probably bring in like this one. Can you see that? Okay, you can't see it. So this, what I've done is I've divided the bowl again. All right. But to get this star pattern, if I had a foot or didn't have a foot, all I need to do is set my pencil down and draw a circle. That gives me what's equal to my foot. Okay. And then I decide how far I want my stars to go out, the points. And I'll choose just a random place. And, the f and so now you've got two circles, and I can draw that star from, from the end, okay? The first time I did it, when I realized what I was doing, I already had it off the lathe, and with a vacuum chuck, putting it back on the same place is a pain in the butt without having to poke a hole in the bottom, and I didn't want to do that. So if you ever forget... Just use a compass. It'll poke a hole in the bottom, but you can sand it out. So then you can take this and make your, your circle here, come back out, widen it to whatever you want to, and make that. So now you can decide. I think I still have that. Can you still hear me? Okay. So this one right here, if you look at that. Okay. It's got larger stars because I did more of the divisions. Or I mean, fewer of the divisions. Okay. And since each one's always a little bit different, my preference. Oh, yeah, okay. My preference is fewer. I mean, the smaller stars going around because I think it has just a little more style, a little more class to it. And when you do the bottom 
flat like this where there's no foot at all, you can decide if you want to do that or choose to bring these in. Okay, bring these in to this circle and bring another set into this circle so that you've got a little bit of variance because if they're all exactly the same, they get too boring. Okay, and if you'll look at this one, if you could see as you went around the room, none of these are the same size. Everyone's just a little bit different. Because if you go pick up a watermelon, I guarantee you they're all different. All right, so that's how I get my, when I'm using a lay like this, this is how I get my, dis uh, the, the dimensions. I can set that up, pull it off. Now I'll take this off here and we can start carving. And again, this is elm. And as I've told people before, I really like elm because the wood is hard enough that I can get a sharp edge. I'll send this one around in just a minute. Let's see. Yeah, I'll send this one around in a minute. But you can feel the sharp edges. So we'll move over here now. And this one hasn't been sanded at all. In fact, I'll let this go around because there's a little bit of time here. But I want you to feel how rough this is right now. If you remember feeling the one that was painted, it's smooth. But you can feel how fine. I call those the feathers, and that's, that's what we're going to cut now. And that's the one we're going to do the, uh, the dyeing on here in just a second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I think I uh, duct taped it to my, tape, my, to my arm. Yeah. Yeah. Easier? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Looks good. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed I couldn't see, but I could sure talk through my eyes. That's what my girlfriends always used to say. Right? Okay. All right, so we'll use this in just a minute. All right, so what can we see? All right. So you can see we've got a division here, a division here. What I think we'll go ahead and do now is we'll go ahead and cut this one. And then we'll cut the narrow one beside it. And maybe we'll even cut this one. Because what I want you to see is the difference in the ridge and how much difference there is in what I call the feathering and how it comes across. Because I've drawn a line here. And I could have drawn this on the lathe. But what I'm trying to do is divide up And it's really going to kind of line itself up with the end of that star. So if I take this one, I don't like that. That doesn't look good. Okay. Hmm. My eraser's good and hard. Okay. So my star begins where this groove is cut. This one. And the reason I draw my stars or my, uh, my points right there now instead of just random starting to cut is because I'm setting the angle of the feathers. That's what I call this is the feathering. And it's funny because my grandkids, like I said, have all watched this thing to go to sleep and I'm trying to get more hits and uh, or likes or whatever it is. I'm up to six now. And... Uh, <laughs> And I've got six grandchildren, so that should tell you everything you need to know. So these points were set. So my grandkids call them feathers, too. They say, Papa, how did you make those feathers? I say, you guys are great. <laughs> you guys are great. All right, so we'll just, we're going to skip this line, and we're going to move it like this. Okay? 
I used to do all the lines here by hand. And it just got to be easier to do it on the lathe. You know, it probably is a little more organic if I would do it by hand. But that's why I do these. So now I'm starting at my center point. I'm looking at halfway in between. And I'm just kind of eyeballing it. You see that? You can tell I should have been an architect. All right. I tried, as I've told people before, I tried little plastic rulers. I tried those little uh, machinist, little metal rulers, laid it across, drew it on it. But when you take a straight line and lay it on a curve, you don't get a straight line. Milk jug. A milk jug. That's milk jug. Gallon milk, gallon, half gallon milk. See, that's so much work. Making a jig for wood turning. That's the closest I've ever come to making the jig for wood turning was that thing right there. So, you know, it's just I'm coming in here. I'm getting my star. All right, so I've centered it up there, and I'll just join them up. And it's fun to say that I actually drew it myself. All right. To get my start, you guys have all seen the carbide cutters. And if probably everybody knows they're back in business. His son or son-in-law has took over the business, and you can buy them again. And uh, are, have they gone up in price? I don't know. Oh, wow. Of course they were. I use the medium round. I tried doing it with a square. I tried doing it with a triangle. I didn't like it. Uh, the round gives me a good pattern to follow, okay? Because I'm getting ready to start. It's kind of like when you're working on any other thing that's so thick, you've got to get the smaller cut first to get your groove started. All right. So who, sells those? who sells these? The carbide cutters? I can't remember the name of the company. I've got a poster right there by my workbench, too. But, um, yeah, is he, is he coming back to SWAT? Okay. So they're great tools. And I'm going to turn this at 30,000 RPM. It, and on this hand piece, that's all it goes to. So I can turn this one to max. And I'm setting it obviously on forward. And let's see. I actually have not used this without the foot pedal before. I apologize. It should be able to go. Oh, turn it on right there. Okay. On, off. This is a guess one. I use the foot pedal all the time so that I can... Uh, my left foot has... It's a variable speed. I like doing it so that I can start and stop. All right. The way I'm holding this, because this is dangerous, this hole right here, it's kind of a knot right now. Last week as I was practicing doing this and I made this bowl right here to kind of make sure I hadn't forgot how to do it since the week before. I was using the little triangle cutter and I came down too far because I'm, I have a bad habit of putting this thumb there to catch everything. And it, it was not a uh, like that table saw, the saw stop. It did not stop. And so when I threw it down, I have one of those mats that you put down on like in the, in the shelf paper, only it's the rubber mat with the little holes to catch your sawdust. And I threw the thing down, and it wrapped up into that, and I thought, well, I better shut this off. And uh, so I did. All right. So, so I'm holding this over the edge, down on, on the edge of the table. I'm setting my depth with this thumb. I'm laying it down. And then I'm tilting it. And I'm following down the line. The depth here and the depth here are about the same. The depth here is about double. Okay? So I have more depth here. So if you look at the way that I've cut these, the bowl thickness is the same from here to here and then I usually do my bowl edges a little bit thicker so that when you grab at your thumb I learned that from Mike Mahoney that's a 
the way he makes his bowl so you can hold on to it better. Okay? But I'm making it deeper in the middle. If you want to make it deeper at the top, that's good. It looks nice, but I'm going to pick that up with the ball that you're going to see us use next. Now that's a pretty straight line. Normally I'm not always that straight. I guess I'm going to do it on the point now, Joel. <laughs> I think that's the way it should be. You're right, I did it wrong. All right, so. You're paying attention. I was just checking. Okay, so I'm deep here, I'm deep here. But that sounds really good in the microphone. Okay. So I've got my three grooves cut in here now. And so now I can go back with my pencil and make some really cool marks like I would have done before had I done my stars like this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay. It's just a pencil mark. Just a pencil mark. Just keep telling yourself that. I, I planned it that way. I really did. All right. And the nice thing is all these millions of people, or at least six, we're going to see this on YouTube. All right. So my next move is I take the, uh, the rough ball. These are from Sabretooth Tools. Lots of different companies make them. This is the rough. And this one you really don't want to grab because it will hurt. And, uh, but it will stop. All right. You know, everybody makes fun. Just I grabbed a chainsaw. Do you realize that that noise is from the chain moving in the motor? This hand still works. So, Guys laugh. It hurt really bad. All right. Once they sewed it back on, everything was fine. All right. So now, if my lines were not straight before, which actually for some reason these are fairly straight, I can use this to straighten it out a lot, okay? This is the great equalizer. And again, my thumb is laying down on the bowl. You need a very low, low torque handpiece. This only goes at 15,000 RPM, but it's very... You see it? You might want to probably use a... Uh, Fordham or a Master Carver. I normally have a fan here and I blow the dust away and I wear a mask. Okay, because you don't want to breathe this boggy elm. You know, when you're sanding and you start with an 80 grit sandpaper, the goal of the 80 grit is to get the grooves out of the wood, right? And then the 120 is to get the grooves or the, the sand, fix, clean up what you did with the 80 and all the way up to 600 or whatever you sand with. I'm doing the same thing here. My first groove, is you can still see it down there in the bottom. Right now, I'm trying to make that go away. And I'm making, I'm making grooves again, but they're less pronounced. If you put your thumb at the bottom of this to hold it, make sure it's offset so when the ball comes down, it won't get your thumb. Eddie Charba took me to the hospital once because I grabbed one of these. And uh, he can't see, he can't tolerate blood. He couldn't tolerate blood. It just bothered him to no end. The edge of the bowl, yes. 
It sure is. You see it right there? Yep. These don't have to be straight, and you'll see why here in just a little bit. <coughs> but it it's, makes it easier to move forward if they're straight. I've done one where I flared this out and made it wider at the top than I did at the bottom, and I kind of like that, but the bowl has to be the right size. And this one I don't think is for that. Okay. Okay, so I've got, what, two more hours to get this done? Oh, my gosh. When I said low torque, I guess I meant low speed, high torque, right? No, this is a uh, guess one. It's German. And I have different hand pieces that have different torque and uh, different speeds. I've got them that go all the way up to 55,000 <coughs> RPM. All right, so now I'll go to the fine ball and I'm going to clean that up. I'm going to clean off all my grooves. And it's really nice and quiet, too. I mean, it's, it's not a loud ball. I mean, it's not, I guess as you're doing this, if you're on a wooden table, it's not near as loud as a plastic table. Or just a piece of plywood. And this doesn't take much. But this is where I'll decide how deep I want the final, final cut to be. Got a little bit right here. Okay. So you'll notice everything's guiding now. So the thumb is guiding on the left. My index finger is guiding on the right. Because when I came here, as I came down, I no longer, because the groove to the side, has taken over my depth gauge. Okay, and so this thumb is no longer guiding, so I have to bring it in. And now, as I got to the bottom again, the index finger came up, the thumb went down. And so I learned how, because if you don't, all of a sudden you find the tool moving. And that was just by trial and error that I thought, well, crap, that sucks. So now I've got to figure out a better way to do it. Because I thought, well, why don't I just hold it out here and do that? Boy, that looks really bad. And because uh, you don't have control. Okay, this one still has a V in it. I want to get rid of that. I want it to start round. I don't want my tool mark from this to show, okay? Because it's harder to take out with the next thing we're going to do, okay? Is that dust coming back there? I'm sorry. All right. The next one we're going to use is the same company. There's a board here. That's right. This one, the 
triangle, they're not flat. Okay? One's down, one's up, and one's up higher. Okay? So this tool right here, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, you can. Okay. It's a great camera. All right. So each one of those is at a different height. So when I cut, I'm going to cut three separate grooves. Okay. Now, let's come back. and Let's get our star cut in the right, drawn in the right spot. Okay. Notice I'm right here at the beginning of the circle. Okay, so I have set my angle that I'm going to follow here. And look at that one. That's really not centered very well. Let's pull that over. Okay. Okay. All right. So now I can follow this here. I'm going to get three little tiny grooves. Let's get it over here. If I magnified it, you'd see those three. Okay. One of the things you can do to give yourself a pattern the first few times you try this instead of taking this to do it just once and hoping you get it the same angle all the way down, just draw a few lines. All these are parallel to each other. Okay. Let's get a better one here too. Okay. All right, so now I've got a parallel line so I can follow that if I want to. That makes it a lot simpler. Yeah, you can see that real well. Okay. Okay. Now again, I'm going 30,000 RPM. If you go too fast with this, your three cuts become one wide cut. If you go too slow, you get too much chipping and, and it will skip. Okay. This one's going to be a little louder. All right, so I come in here. All right, do you notice where I just pulled the bowl and my hand dropped down? Because if you try and hold it up like this, you're going to cut the end of your thumb off. And then you don't have to trim your thumbnail very often. It makes it nice, but it doesn't match the rest of your hand. All right, so... Now I'm coming back. I'll find myself doing this this way. I'll do it in different directions because I get tired of it, I guess, and I'll move it back. Um, sometimes, like when I did this one the other day, I did all of them on the right side and t spun it around like this, then I turned it around, and then I did all of them on the left side from up here. You just try to find out the best way, because I don't want to get carpal tunnel. I don't want to get cramps in my hand. If you do one of these by, just straight on by itself, these fingers get just like that. And you can't get into, and you just have to come and stretch them. So I don't do that. I just don't, it's not that critical that I do it all at one time. Okay, now, I came from the curve to there. There's my first one. All right, if you'll, you can't see it, but if you looked at these, the grooves in these feathers are not all the same depth. Some are high, some are low. And that's where you get the definition of this thing. And you find yourself getting into a groove and a rhythm, and you get faster especially when you're trying to do a couple of them in one weekend. 
And this one, notice my thumb is in place. And I'm ending up on my pencil line. And I'm coming back. All right. When, let's go farther down so I can show you a little bit more of how it goes. Okay, if you notice, you saw in each one of these, the grooves, the feathering went all the way down inside that round groove, because I was trying to figure out the best way to see how it looked, and I would start by, yes, sir. No, no, they're all the same. They're all pointing down. See this one right here? They're pointing down. These are all pointing down. If you go to the groove or the middle part, yep, they're pointing up. But if, if you look right here, you can see my tool came down just like that. Like here. Exactly the same. Every single time. All right, and now I'm going to show you how I get that. Because I use that because these edges are sharp and I don't like the looks of that groove right here. All right. So I bring my feathers all the way down. And I take a separate cut and I line it up halfway with the other. Now I'm down in the middle of that circle or the cup, the little ditch. So then I'll come over to the one beside it, Let's get it going. Don't go this fast till you've done it for a little while. But I'm trying to get it, so I apologize for the dust. Didn't even think about that. Okay, so now I've got my feathers on both sides. I want to join them inside of the groove, or inside the little valley. But I'm not just doing inside the valley right now. I'm knocking off my sharp edge. It becomes rounded. This edge is very sharp. These edges are gone. Sometimes you're going to find a piece of wood that gets real punky. This one on one side was right here it was very very punky and I had to be very careful and even when I sanded it it didn't come out the same and I really had to work on it to try to make it look better this piece of wood solid all over this one solid that one was solid so it's no big deal but so now I'm knocking off that corner okay so now I've done that whole little ditch right there Okay, and now I'm down here at the bottom. All right, the, if I go down here, I lose control because I have nothing, I have nothing to guide. Okay, so I could, I can probably get a little farther. But now so when you come back, Okay, so now I've done this side. I'm going to come down, and since it's the opposite way, I've got to control my cut so that I don't come over to this side. If I overcut in the little valley, I can make up for it when I come down here. Okay, so now I can come back inside. I'm stabilized on my leg, the edge of the table. Doesn't look like it maybe, but.
And coming all the way down inside that valley. So this side, this time, I overcut. It's and maybe not. Let's see if I when I bring it down here. But you can balance it right back up without a problem. So right here, I can still see the ridges of that ball. And I also have a little more ridge up here on top. So I'm going to bring that off. Okay. Wow, okay, so there we go. Now, this edge is a little rounder than this one. But when we go to the sanding process, you'll be able to knock that right off and you'll never notice it. Because right now, I have so little wood sticking up there that it's really easy to sand back. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, so everybody understand how we came back here? It's kind of like when you're hand carving. Sometimes the wood won't let you go a certain direction. You can run into the same thing with this. And so all of a sudden you have to turn and try to figure out how do I do this and still keep my line straight. And wearing reading glasses doing this is probably not the best. But I have a good sharp edge on all of this. All these are sharp. 